How are we doing, Cedar Brook? Okay, okay. Hey, my name is James Brown. I am one of the pastors at this place. And if you happen to be new with us today, just so glad that you are here, uh, that you're part of this sermon and this series. Uh, we are, as, as uh, Kyle said, we are just in the middle, smack dab in the middle of this summer series called Need to Know. And this June, July, what we're doing is we're looking at a few need-to-know Hebrew words that will help us to understand God's story just a little bit better. And so to introduce the word for today, I want to start off with a question. And I want to say that as a way to warn you that this question is kind of, kind of a heavy question. And I want to warn you uh, about this question because when I ask it, your tendency is going to be to check out of the message. Please, please, please don't do that. I want you to think about this question when I ask it, and I want you to stick with me throughout the entire message. Why? Well, because I'm going to take you to a location that I'm guessing you haven't maybe ever traveled before. I'm going to take you to a place specifically in the Bible and explain something that I hope adds another layer to your faith. But before we get there, I just need to ask this question. This is the tough question, and here it is. Have you ever felt really really guilty before? Have you ever felt really, really guilty before? I'm talking about intense guilt. I'm talking about big time, big time shame. I remember the first time that, that I felt incredible guilt and shame. I was about my daughter's age. She's 11. And, uh, and I was at a department store and I saw something that I wanted. So I took it. I took it. And this is, they had cameras. And so they came out, kind of swarmed on me. I had to give it back. And then I had to go talk to my parents about what had happened, and I will never forget as I walked toward them and they were walking toward me, the, the look on their face um, caused this intense wave of guilt and shame that I had never, ever felt before. And that, and that was the first time. There's been many of those since, and, and that's my story, but what about you? Has there ever been a time where you felt really, really guilty before? Maybe, maybe it was over something that you did, or maybe over something that you should have done that you didn't do. Maybe you're losing a battle with some addiction, and the guilt around that uh, is really great. Maybe for you, you wear a big D on your chest that reminds you of a failed marriage or failed marriages. Maybe the guilt is related to some moral failure at school or at work or as a parent. Maybe you have a secret that nobody knows uh, about but you and God, or maybe just to put it bluntly, your guilt comes from the fact that you just have messed up your life. Maybe it's something you did or didn't do. Maybe it's something else entirely. Maybe it's something that happened to you and it wasn't even your fault. Maybe there was an inappropriate behavior by a parent or a relative or a teacher or a coach or a supervisor. Maybe you were taken advantage of and someone abused you or they forced you to do something that you don't want to do. And even though that person is no longer around you, they're no longer a part of your daily life, you're still stuck dealing with that shame, dealing with that guilt, even to today. And so I ask again, have you ever felt really, really guilty before? Now, I told you, it's a tough question. It's a heavy question to ask and answer. And my guess is that for most of us, if not all of us, we've been there. We've been there at some time because we live in a broken world. And sin uh, takes a serious toll on every single area of our lives. Whether that guilt is self-induced or whether it's other-induced, it doesn't take long before it becomes this miserable, energy-draining, gut-wrenching, never-ending, nagging feeling that just won't go away. If you have that, I want, you to, I want you to just take a second and go there to think about that guilt. I want you to feel the weight of it just for a moment so that you can consider this possibility. What if tomorrow, what if tomorrow was the day when you could make it all go away? What if tomorrow was a day when you could make that guilt, make that shame all go away? Away. What, if, what if tomorrow all the bad stuff that you've done or all the bad stuff that's been done to you, all the sins that you've committed or all the sins that have been committed against you, all, all the shame that you've shouldered and has been smothering you for months or years or decades, what if tomorrow all of it could be gone? Now, let me ask it this way. What if tomorrow is the day when all your guilt is lifted and carried away right before your very eyes? That would, be, that would be a great day, right? 
Unfortunately, we don't have a day like this, so if you want to stand for closing prayer, that'll be it. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, we don't have a day like that. It's not like a national holiday or anything, but I don't know if you know this, even though we don't have a day like this, the early story of God tells about a day like this, that God, in his story, as he's creating it with his people, he actually gave them this kind of day. And this is our need-to-know word of the day. The day that I'm referring to is a day called Yom Kippur. Say Yom Kippur. Kippur. Say it with passion. It sounded the same both times. Okay. (laughs) Yom Kippur is also known as the Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur. Yom is Hebrew for day. And then Kippur, the word that you need to know for today for this series, is the Hebrew word for atonement. And atonement is a, a kind of a Bible word. It's, it's a word that's out there, but it's a word that simply means an action to right a wrong in order for parties to reconcile. It's an action that gets taken in order to right some wrong so that people that are at war or fighting or separated relationally can begin to come together. It's, it's even in the word, at one mint. At one mint. It, it means this reconciliation of two parties through some specific action. And that's what that word means to us in this day. But I want to show you what it means specifically as a follower of Jesus. And to do that, we've got to go to God's Word. So if you have your Bible or your Bible app with you today, I want to invite you to go with me to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16, maybe a place you've never been before. And when we get to this chapter, what we're going to see with our very own eyes is what a day looks like that is solely dedicated to the removal of guilt. And it's in this chapter, but unfortunately for many people, Leviticus is one of those Bible books that that most people just kind of fast forward through. But if we do, if we skim, we miss the gem in Leviticus 16. And I want to show you what that is. So Leviticus 16, we're going to start in verse 2, which says this. The Lord said to Moses... Warn your brother Aaron not to enter the most holy place behind the inner curtain whenever he chooses. If he does, he will die. Why will he die? Well, it's explained. For the ark's cover, we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant, you know, Indiana Jones, that's this thing. The ark's cover, the place of atonement, that's our word, Kapoor, the place of atonement is there. The ark is in this holy of holies room. And I myself, God talking, am present in a cloud above the atonement, Kapoor, the Kapoor cover. Okay, God's saying, when you come into the holy of holies, make sure Aaron knows that when he enters into this space that he needs to do it in the right way. Because he's going to be coming in to this ark of the covenant, this atonement cover, and I'm going to be there above it in a cloud. My presence is going to be in this space, so you need to approach it correctly. And that's what he says in verse 3. When Aaron enters the sanctuary area, he must follow these instructions fully. Now, there's a lot in these two verses here, uh, but for us to begin to understand and start to connect the, the Bible dots here from the Old Testament to the New Testament where we live today, we have to do some digging. We have to do some sort of research context. And I, I want to take you on that journey. So we have to put our thinking caps on just for a little bit. We have to do some digging because this is unfamiliar probably to most of us. This whole scene, it takes place in what is called the tabernacle. The tabernacle. What's that? Well, the tabernacle was a temporary mobile tent that the Jewish people used to worship during their journey from Egypt to the promised land. And this is an example of uh, one that is set up. It could have looked very similar to this. We don't know exactly. But it was set up right in the middle of the camp. So wherever they traveled, whenever they would set up camp, the, this tabernacle would be right in the middle of that camp, right in the middle of their temporary city. And the tabernacle said to the Israelites, and it said to all the neighboring nations of wherever they are, God is with us. God goes with us. He, his presence is here in this place. Now, within that context of the tabernacle, there were a series of rooms, and part of the rooms, uh, as you get further into it, one of the rooms, the last room, is called the Holy of Holies, or the holiest place. And this is where God would meet with initially Moses, but eventually Aaron, and then it would ultimately become the place where God symbolically dwelled. And as you can see from the picture, it's the innermost room. I put it there with the arrow and the star. You kind of have to go through 
a gate on the outside and then through a room. And then the, the back room is, is where the Ark of the Covenant was. And at this point in Israel's history, uh, you could only enter into that room one time per year. And there was only one person that could even go in, the high priest. The high priest. Uh, in this story that we're looking at, that's Aaron, who is Moses' brother. It was Mo's bro. He's the guy who could enter into this most holiest of places. And when he did, it had to be done exactly right. And we're not going to read them, but that's why verse 4, 5, and 6 describe how Aaron had to meticulously prepare himself for this moment. He had to get dressed just right. He had to bathe just right. After all, he was going to go into this space, this most holiest of place, uh, places, to act on behalf of the nation. He was going into the presence of God as a representative for all of the people of Israel. And he was going to do this atonement process. He was going to go through this ritual in order that God's people and God could be reconciled. He was going to do an act that would make that right, that relationship right again. He was seeking forgiveness and atonement, a covering for sin on behalf of all of the people. He was doing an act to right a wrong to reconcile at one minute. And this, what he was about to do, this Operation Atonement, would become ultimately the world's greatest cover-up. That would eventually happen because it's all pointing towards something that we'll see eventually. But first, before we get there, i got to warn you, it's going to get a little bloody, just so you know. And it starts with two goats. It starts with two goats. Look at verse 7. Then he, Aaron, must take the two male goats and present them to the Lord at the entrance of the tabernacle. Verse 8. He is to cast sacred lots, which essentially means roll the dice or flip a coin. He's to cast sacred lots to determine which goat will be reserved as an offering to the Lord, a.k.a. it's going to die, and which which goat will be the one that will carry the sins of the people to the wilderness of Azazel. Now, this is a whole other thing we don't have time to get into, but it's fascinating. But essentially, he's going to carry it out into an uninhabited, desolate place. And so, verse 9, Aaron will present... As a sin offering, the goat chosen by Lot for the Lord. And so what you have so far is two goats. One lives, one dies. They flip a coin. Goat number one loses, and he gets his throat slit. Uh, We don't really know about this. It's not part of our daily activity. So just to give you an idea, I found a video on YouTube of this process that I want to show you now. Go ahead and play it. Just kidding. I wouldn't do that. People were like... Parents were like covering their kids' eyes last service. It was hilarious. Uh, No, I I won't show you that because it's disgusting, which some of you are hearing this and reading this, and you're like, why are we even talking about this? I mean, why is the Old Testament like this? Why is the Old Testament like R-rated for violence? (laughs) Like all throughout, why, why does God hate these animals? Why is he all the time killing the cute little birds and sheep and lambs and goats? Why are they always dying in this older part of the Bible? Well, i got to tell you, it's all about Kippur. It's all about atonement. Because the reality of the situation is God is holy and God is just. And what that means is that God hates sin. And what that means is that sin has to be punished. God is holy and he's just. But God's also loving and God's also merciful. Which means that he is willing to provide a way for sins to be forgiven. What God has done is given the nation of Israel an avenue of atonement, a way to make their relationship with him right again when it's been injured. And because God entered into the human story at this point in history, he chose to do it this way. He chose to create an avenue of atonement involving priests and animal sacrifices and lots and lots and lots of blood. He started with where they were, and he used the practices of that day, but he made them different. He made them different in a very significant way, as we will see back in Leviticus 16. We get to see what this process looked like on Yom Kippur, on this Day of Atonement. Check it out in verse 15. It says this, Then Aaron must slaughter the first goat as a sin offering for the people, and then carry its blood behind the inner curtain, going back to the Holy of Holies. There he will sprinkle the goat's blood over the atonement, the Kippur cover, and in front of it, just as he did with the bull's blood. He's going to go with a bowl of this goat's blood into the Holy of Holies, and he's going to sprinkle blood 
on the Ark of the Covenant, and he's going to sprinkle it in front of the Ark of the Covenant as well. And why? Well, verse 16. Through this process, he will purify the most holy place, and he will do the same for the entire tabernacle because of the defiling sin and rebellion of the Israelites. Goat number one's blood, it gets sprinkled on the Kippur cover, on the Ark of the Covenant, to purify the tabernacle. And then goat number two gets to be the scapegoat. We know that term. And that's where this word Azazel comes from, this scapegoat. As, in ancient Semitic languages, as uh, is translated goat, and Azel is translated go away. So there's a second goat, is the, this is this go away goat. <laughs> it's called the go away goat, uh, which is introduced back in verse 10. Look at it. The other goat, the go away goat, the scapegoat chosen by Lot, will be sent away, will be kept alive, standing before the Lord. When it is sent away to Azazel in the wilderness, this desolate, uninhabited wilderness, the people will, the people will be purified, and here it is, and made right with the Lord. That's that reconciliation. That's the atonement. Now skip down to verse 21, because this is where the process of that is described. Verse 21 says, And he, the high priest, will lay both of his hands on the goat's head and confess over it all the wickedness, rebellion, and sins of the people of Israel. In this way, he will transfer the people's sins to the head of the goat. Then a man, specially chosen for the task, will drive the goat into the wilderness. Verse 22, as the goat goes into the wilderness, it will carry away all the people's sins upon itself into a desolate land. Now, you're like, what in the world is this message about? Right, so I, I, and I agree, it's very confusing. And this process is very complicated. And so I wanted to try to make it a little simpler for us to understand together. And to demonstrate this, uh, I, I want to introduce you to, and I don't even know if you knew we had these. These are like our mascots. We, I want to introduce you to our two Cedarbrook goats. You want to see them? High Priest Mike, bring forth the goats. That one there, that's, a, that's the fainting goat, just so you know. He's, he's got issues. He's got issues. Here, let me help you, buddy. This is High Priest Mike. I'm going to set these goats up here. here. Yeah, there you go. All right, good. These are pretty cool, right? These are, these are called goat carts. This is. Just kidding. Anyway. Now, as a way of review, as a way of review, goat number one, what happens to goat number one? Which one's goat number one? This guy right here. What happens to him? Yeah, right there. He's going to die. He gets the knife. And then his blood is sprinkled on top of the Ark of the Covenant and as well as in front of the Ark of the Covenant as well. So do your duty. Uh, Hi, Priest Mike. So he's, he's going away to never be seen again. Okay? All right. So he's gone. Hey, Mike, how's it going back there? I know it's a sheep. I know. It's just, I like the screaming part. Anyway, so that's goat number one. He's gone. And now we got this guy here. We got goat, goat number two. I'll point you this way, buddy. Yep, goat number two. Now he's going to have a part of the process as well. And what, as we talked about, we're going to lay the hands on the goat's head to confess the sins of the people, right? So upon this goat, I confer the sins of Pastor Kyle who has purchased way too many Nike shoes. He has way too many. His greed abounds. And I also want to confer upon this goat the sins of Pastor James, who although is strikingly handsome in many ways, deals with pride about that. We want to give that to you, goat. Right? And yours as well. And yours as well. This this part of the process takes forever, right? Because he's conferring the sins of the people Onto the goat. He's sim- symbolically transferring the guilt onto the goat. Then what happens to goat number two? Where, where does he go? Well, he gets led out of the camp. Somebody takes it away out into the wilderness. Because the last thing that you want to see have happen is the scapegoat find its way back into the Israelite camp. Right, man? That'd be a bummer, right? That's like the sign of a terrible, terrible year, right? So goat number two is led away. And that's the moment that the nation has been waiting for. Because they believed... According to God's word, that when the goat left the camp, so did all of their sin and guilt as well. 
I love this. All of the junk, all of the guilt, all of the shame that they had been carrying was now covered by the blood of goat number one. And their sins are now being removed from their lives by goat number two. All that junk, all that sin, all that shame that they had been carrying around for the last 365 days was now going to be covered by that first goat. And their sins that they had committed were going to be taken away, removed from the life of that second goat. And that is the avenue of atonement that God created. That is the process by which God created to bring that relationship back together again. That's how it was made right. That's the Old Testament sacrificial system. And this system went on this way for like 1,400 years. Once a year, the priest would offer his atonement sacrifice to cover the sins of the people. He would do that every single year. It was an amazing system, but it was an imperfect system because it had to be repeated every single year. It was imperfect because it was a prelude. It was a sign. It was a type of what was to come. Because 1,400 years later, the last animal sacrifice was finally made. Which sort of forces us to ask the question, right? Why don't we do animal sacrifices anymore? And I would argue that we do. We just call it Texas Roadhouse and Famous Dave's and Big Guy's Barbecue in Hudson. I love that place, right? No, I'm just kidding. Seriously, though, why don't we do this? Why don't we do this anymore? Why don't we do what we read about in Leviticus chapter 16? Well, because the good news is God replaced that old system with something brand new. He replaced that old system with something that was immeasurably better, something that didn't need to be repeated every single year. And God's new way of doing things is all about Jesus. In fact, I think the writer of Hebrews said it best in Hebrews chapter 9 when they wrote, So Christ has become, now become the high priest over all good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. Look at verse 12. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. In other words, the brand new Kippur, the brand new atonement thing includes a new tabernacle that is Jesus. In fact, in John chapter 1, verse 14, the writer John says this. He says that Jesus came to this earth and dwelt among us. That that word in Greek is actually the word tabernacle. He came and tabernacled among us. There's a new tabernacle, but there's also a new priest, God's son. He's perfect. No ceremonial washings needed for Jesus. He was the sinless, spotless lamb of God. In this new thing that God has created, there's also a new sacrifice. It wasn't, it wasn't goats or bulls. It was God's son offering himself, shedding his own blood, giving his life as a covering for the whole world. And there's also a new scapegoat. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, becoming our scapegoat, our Azazel, the one who carries away our sin. Do you begin to see how some of this old and new Old Testament Jesus, it starts to fit together and makes it better. It it all started with a couple of goats and it ended with the goat, the greatest of all time, the greatest sacrifice of all time. Jesus is the goat of goats, right? Right? This is the avenue of atonement that God created a long time ago as it all points back to Jesus, which is what I would like to do right now. I want to point to Jesus because the truth of the matter is some of you are still living like we're in the Old Testament days. You're still living and carrying around the guilt and the shame that God has set you free from. You're living as if Jesus' blood was never shed for you. You're living like the, the goat came back and you've put it in your closet to keep it. You're beating yourself up over things that ha- Jesus has forgiven. You keep sacrificing and sacrificing and sacrificing, hoping that that one sacrifice will make everything feel better. But this story tells us that it doesn't have to be this way. 
I mean, think about it this way. Put, put yourself in the sandals of one of these Israelites just for a second. I mean, you've been waiting 365 days for this moment. You, you've carried the weight of your sin and shame around all year long. Can you imagine, just imagine the emotion, the joy, the exuberance in the camp of God's people when the scapegoat was finally led away? Because it meant release. It meant freedom. Freedom. Guess what the people would do in that moment? What, would they act like it was a funeral? Not at all. They would celebrate good times. Come on. They would P-A-R-T-Y party. They would get loud. They would make some serious noise. Why? Because the goat was gone. And I want us to take a moment to act that out, to, to step into this story today. So we're going to take Billy here, and I'm going to invite Cedar Brook's very own goat girl to come here. And lead this out, lead this out. And I want us to act as if we are these Hebrew people where the goat is leaving the camp. That's the bet. That's it. That's all you got. Come on. Come on now. That was mediocre at best. Yep. That, that's the old way. I wanted you to see the old way. Because God has actually given us something new. He's given us something better because he's given us Jesus. You see, today you can let the goat take your guilt. You can let the goat take your shame. Because, friends, the goat has left the building. Your real Azazel, Jesus, is no longer on the cross. And he's no longer buried in a tomb. So the next time someone brings up your past, the next time someone looks down their self-righteous nose at you, the next time somebody tries to heap a bunch of guilt at you, the next time somebody tries to remind you of those past sins that you've confessed to God and he's already forgiven, just remember that. The goat has left the building. Today is your Yom Kippur Today is your day of atonement. Jesus, your Azazel, died in your place. And the last words on the cross were, it is finished. Friends, it is finished. You don't have to add anything to his sacrifice. You don't have to shed your own blood. It's done. This is your moment of atonement. Because the greatest sacrifice of all time, that goat, has left the building. And he wants to enter into your life today. You just need to embrace it. You just need to receive what he's already done for you and accept his offer of forgiveness. And the good news is that you can do that today. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this story. We thank you for the ancient Hebrew people who year after year sent this goat out into Azazel, out into the uninhabited wilderness as a symbol of your forgiveness of their sins to reconcile that relationship once again. And God, we thank you as well for the atoning sacrifice that Jesus offers us now that is new and is better because it doesn't have to be done annually, but it was done once for all. That he took our place. He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He took our sin and gave us his life. The greatest exchange from the greatest sacrifice of all time. And God, I pray for those of us who have already received that. That we would begin to live in that truth. That the goat has left our lives. The sin and shame that holds us back would be released. So that we could be free. And God, I pray for those that are on the verge of saying yes to that offer, that today, today they would receive your forgiveness and that they would walk out of this place different than they walked in. And God, we thank you for the goat, the greatest sacrifice of all time. And we pray these things in his wonderful name. And all God's people said,